Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Might as well start from the beginning. How's that? So, <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. Now, uh, actually, before we get started, did we have that video ready? Do we have that ready? No? Yes, no? Okay. All right. We'll do it later. All right. Genesis chapter 1. We, um, as, as we said earlier this morning, um, there was some other things I was really wanting to preach, and hopefully the Lord will let me do it at some point. Uh, but today, he said, go back and do this. And so we are going to um, minister something that I've ministered before, which was really my argument with the Lord is, Lord, I've already ministered that, and the people have heard it. And he said, well, it won't hurt them to hear it again. And then he reminded me what Peter and Paul both said, that it would so, that it's, uh, if we're not careful, we let things slip. And sometimes we let things slip past us and we forget. And uh, Peter said it's, it's that he wrote these things so that he could stir up your remembrance uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so I have no problem, uh, as you may know, of repetition. God has freed me from the fear of repetition. Uh, so I can repeat things if necessary. And I know that uh, usually it takes several times for people to hear anything before they actually get it. Amen. And so, and usually even after that, more times before they actually start walking in it. So we're going to talk this morning about you taking your position in Christ and what that position is. Because So remember, we're not just giving a lesson. What we're sharing is how, it's, it's, it's actually what position Jesus has provided for you, and then you have to make the decision to step into that position and start functioning in what we're talking about today, right? But if you do, then you will, just by reason of doing it, you will begin to grow up and to grow up more in Christ and to start seeing the things of God in your life the way you want to. So, uh, now, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, it says in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I remember years ago I heard Charles Capps preach on that, and he said, Aren't you glad to know that you have authority and dominion over creeps? Anything that creeps, amen? So it's good to have authority over creeps. So, but now notice, he gave man authority over everything that swam, everything that flew, uh, everything that, that creeps upon the earth. I mean, that covers it all, right? So he says here in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Now, I don't have time to go into all these words, but actually, if you go and look at this, especially the word uh, subdue, it literally has a military connotation to it, right? So it means to, to have a discipline and to have an orderly approach uh, to actually exerting this dominion. Then he says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, so first off, we see God gave man dominion on the earth. Now, one of the things, and hopefully in the 9 o'clock session, we answered a question that we get a lot uh, about God's ways and his thoughts being above man's ways and man's thoughts. And if you were here for that, you will, then you had that answered for you, maybe if that was a question you had. Uh, but we answered that. Well, in this one, we're also going to cover a point here that if you listen carefully and you get the point of the message this morning, uh, you, you will never again ask, God, why did you let this happen? I mean, I ha don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but honestly, how many people have ever said, God, why are you letting this happen? God, why don't you do something? God, you know, why is this happening? <clears throat> well, you will get your answer today. We're going to share with you why these things happen. I'm not going to share with you why God lets it happen. I'm going to share with you the truth about why it happens. All right? So, now... Look at Psalm 115, <clears throat> Genesis 126 through 28 gives man dominion. Notice, God gave man dominion over the earth, over everything. Now, if you actually analyze it while you're turning to Psalm 115, if you actually analyze the words used, <clears throat> it says everything that swims, everything that walks, crawls, and then everything that flies. That means that God gave man dominion over everything concerning the earth, including the atmosphere around the earth. 
right? Now, the atmosphere around the Earth, depending on how far you want to go out, but usually about 90 miles up uh, is whatever the atmosphere starts actually completely changing. And so about at that level uh, is how far man's dominion went, okay, okay? Just based on these things. So you'll, you'll see this as we go. And it says in Psalm 115, now look at this, in verse 13, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. It's good news, right? These are all good words. <clears throat> verse 15, you are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. Now look at verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the children of men. Amen. Now, you see how clear that is? The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he gave to man, right? It says the children of men, man to the children of men. Now, notice in Genesis 1, we see uh, God giving dominion to Adam, to man. And that dominion was to go throughout man and throughout all of Adam's children and Adam's children's children all the way down. That was the intended uh, idea. Now, <clears throat> we see in Psalm 115, uh, and I, I, I keep going back to Genesis 126. Here's the, the, the main thing you want to remember about this, is that when God gave dominion, even though he knew what was going to happen, and even though it did happen, and we, you'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute if you don't already have an idea, uh, when that happened, God did not step in and say, okay, I'm taking that dominion back. He didn't say, well, okay, Adam, you don't know what you're doing. You're handing dominion over to Satan because you're obeying him and you are the servant of whoever you obey. <clears throat> he said, so, but God did not step in and say, hey, uh, I'm going to take that dominion back. Remember when I said that you'd have dominion over everything? Okay, well, that's, that's no good anymore. Okay, why did he not do that? He never changes, exactly. What did he say? He said, I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth. So he had to work around that and yet still know that that was the case. So God gave man dominion. Now, now think about this. God gave man dominion to the point that even God himself couldn't step in and do something about it. That's big, right? Why? But that's fact. That's what God did. He said, I give you dominion. He didn't say, okay, <clears throat> Adam, I'm going to share dominion with you. And if you start to mess up, then I'm going to revert it back to me. No, that's not dominion. Right? And so he didn't do that. He gave man dominion over the earth. And he tells us right here in Psalm 115. He says, the, the heaven belongs to God, but the earth he gave. He gave to the children of men. Earth belongs to man. Do you get that? Yeah. Now, but you say, well, but, but I thought, you know, uh, you know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. To the degree that that man that owns those cattle, give those cattle to God. You're awful quiet. Do you get that? Now, what that means is that God, and even uh, John Wesley and several others have, have actually said along the same lines, they said it seems as though God can do nothing on this earth except he first get it or speak to his prophets or get it to a person of God that can then speak it out. So God has to work in conjunction with man's dominion, and that's one of the reasons why God wants our wills to be submitted to his will so that he can get his will done on this earth. Amen. Right? Because right now... The only will that's being done is the devil slash man, right? God, that's why he said, pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't that right? Yes. So if we have to pray that, that means that his will is not automatically being done. And if his will is not automatically being done, it means that he does not have control over that, except that we give him control. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, what you're going to see today, if you hadn't already guessed, is you're going to see a big, or you're going to receive a big dose of responsibility. And you're going to realize that what goes on, I mean, and there's, I got so many scriptures, I really don't have time to go into all of them today. <clears throat> but what is actually happening is that what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Now those are King James words, and they literally mean what you forbid on earth is forbidden in heaven. And what you permit on earth is permitted in heaven. You get that? What does that mean? That means that anything that's happening, it's not God's doing. We shouldn't be saying, God, why did you let this happen? Because if you ask him that, he's going to turn around and go, why did you let it happen? Yeah. I told you you could stop it. 
And if you stopped it, I'd stop it. But if you don't stop it, I can't stop it. Why? Because the earth belongs to man. You get that? Now, watch. He says, <clears throat> the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Now, so notice Genesis 1, 26 to 28. We know this. God gave man dominion. Then Satan come in and Adam essentially handed over the dominion of this world and the authority of this, over this world to Satan. Why? Because it was Adam's and whoever Adam served, it would become theirs. But now notice, just as God had to work through man, so does the devil. That's right. See, the devil can't just run around doing everything he wants to do any more than God can. Why? Because if he could, we'd all be dead already. That's right. I mean, he would have got rid of us a long time ago, right? Yeah. But he can't, right? Now watch. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to show you the proof behind this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, I think we can all agree that the God of this world that it's talking about here isn't the God of heaven, right? Because why would the God of heaven blind the minds from people uh, that, that would not allow them to be able to see the glorious gospel, right? So it is not God, our Heavenly Father, who has blinded the minds, and it is not the God, uh, our Heavenly Father, who is the God of this world. So we know here that the God of this world, technically speaking, is Satan, right? And especially when it says world, it's talking about this world system and the, the, the workings of the world, you could even say. So it says here... <clears throat> in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Now go with me to Luke chapter 4, and I will prove this to you. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> now, I want to I add something right here. Uh, during the announcements, Hannah read a testimony uh, about a person that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues the way that the book of Acts shows us, right? Now, here's something that I think we might have maybe missed or maybe need, we need to think about. Salvation was the greatest gift that God has ever given to the world, right? Came through Jesus. We could say Jesus is the greatest gift. I get it. But salvation was the greatest gift that God ever gave to the world. In other words, the, wor the world can receive it and, and can move into salvation. The greatest gift God ever gave to the church was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Because the Holy Spirit, we are told that you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You, it's a gift. It is given. You receive it like you would a gift. But here's the thing. We need to realize, and, and, and honestly, um, what should have happened, let me just say it this way, is whenever Hannah read that testimony about a person being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking of the tongues, we should have cheered. There should have been a whole lot more cheering. Right? Why? Because it's the greatest gift God has given us. It is, not, it is a gift of God himself Amen. to where God himself, God the Holy Spirit, moves into us and can begin to function in us and bring to remembrance everything that Jesus said. The power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, has been so overlooked by the church and in many cases just pushed aside because they were embarrassed or whatever it was because of it. But a lot of what they're embarrassed of is how people act in the flesh about it rather than what actually takes place because of the Holy Spirit, right? <clears throat> so we have to realize that the Holy Spirit moving into a person, the moment he moves into you in that way, you have direct access and availability of the entire degree of the power of God. That's the power that lives in you. Why? Because it is according to the power that works in you that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can think or ask. And that power is the power that was released at the resurrection of Jesus, which was the greatest display of power in, in the world's history. Right? And so it is vitally important that we not <clears throat> overlook or and somehow diminish the value of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? The, the, you cannot talk about it too much or put it that way. You cannot overdo it in the sense that uh, once you realize what that, what you actually received whenever he moved into you, it is amazing, right? And so we emphasize that a lot. Now, 
<clears throat> it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, notice he was led into the wilderness, being tempted 40 days of the devil. Now, first off, <clears throat> this is, I firmly believe, why Jesus pr said, pray this way. Whenever he gave the Lord, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer, but it's called the Lord's Prayer. When he said, and lead us not into temptation. Remember that part? And say, now, why did he have us say that? Why? Because it's not a matter of, uh, he, he, he doesn't lead us into temptation anyway. Right? It says when a man's tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust. Right? God doesn't tempt. He said, you can't, you're not tempted of God, and God doesn't tempt any man with sin. So why would Jesus have us say something and pray something that is, and, and be talking to God about it when God, that's not God's department. See, it makes no sense unless you realize that whenever you pray that and you say, lead us not into temptation, you also have to put that with Mark 11, 23 and 24, that when you pray, believe that you receive. See, if I pray, lead me not into temptation, and I believe I receive the answer, then I know that any temptation that comes is not from God. Why? Because I have prayed and received the answer to my prayer that I will not be led into temptation by God, so I know if temptation comes, it's not from God. Do you get that? That's the only reason that could be there, right? It's so that we know that if and when temptation comes, it is not from God. Right. You got that? <clears throat> so, and now... Notice here he says, um, <clears throat> and I would remind you too, it says being, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted 40 days of the devil. Uh, and the other reason why uh, you know it's never God that tempts or leads you into temptation is because you really don't need his help to get there. Uh, you find your own way there pretty easily, right? So you don't need his help, all right? So, so here he says in verse, in, right after that, and afterward he hungered. And the devil said unto him, if you be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Now notice, every time <clears throat> that the devil tempted Jesus, we have three recorded temptations here, and every time he mentions it, he always brings it from the same direction. He always says, if you're the Son of God. Okay? Now this is a point you need to remember. <clears throat> the devil always attacks by way of your identification, your identity. Right? He always tries to say, well, if you're a Christian. And see, he will attack in that way by saying, if you're a son of God, if you're a child of God. Well, if, and, and let me tell you, the devil works through people. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we just said a while ago? God works through people. The devil works through people. And many times, whenever pe the devil is trying to work through people, he'll say, wait, and I thought you were a Christian. And I see the way you acted. I see, the, oh, and you talked to that person that way. Or you said, and I thought you were a Christian. What is that? The devil's attacking you through your identity. Right? Listen. Yeah, we should be perfect, okay? I don't know anybody that's attained that yet. I, most people I know are shooting for it. You know, we're still heading that direction. And believe me, whenever, like with myself, if I mess up, you cannot be harder on me than I am myself, right? I'm a lot harder on myself than you could ever be on me. Why? Because I know better than anybody how good God has been to me, okay? <laughs> and so I'm hard on myself if I mess up. But I also had to learn to give it to God, turn over to Him, and then never bring it up again. Right? Repent, receive forgiveness, cleansing, return to righteousness, and don't bring it back up. Why? Because God doesn't. So if anybody else does, they're working for the devil. Isn't that right? Isn't that simple? It's the easy way to remember it. Now, so our job is to help restore people, right? Not to point out the faults. Our job is to point Jesus, right? Because you don't get anybody, you don't win anybody by pointing out their faults. You win them by pointing out Jesus. And then, because if they don't want to change, they're not going to change anyway. You point out Jesus, they want to change, they'll move toward him. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time, right? So, now, he says, If you be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Jesus answered, saying, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, he says, but by every word of God. So what does that also tell us? Here's a way to win any temptation. Anytime the devil says something, anytime the devil tries to tempt you, how do you win? It is written. Not Brother Curry said, right? I mean, I know I get quoted a lot. I, I hear it from people all the time. But I'm telling you, what you need to know is not just what Brother Curry said. Now, hopefully what Brother Curry says is it is written. Amen? I, I do my best with the help of the Holy Spirit to say what is written, right? At the same time, the devil's not going to listen to you if you go, well, Brother Curry said, he ain't going to listen to you. He only listens to it is written, 
right? So you need to know what is written. That's why I tell people all the time, when I read scripture out, don't just listen, read along with me, right? Don't take my word for it. I, I, I do my best to be accurate and, and all that, but I don't ever ask anybody to take my word for it, right. amen? Because anybody can make a mistake and, and you know, uh, say something slightly wrong or something like that. Always read scripture, always go back, read every word, read it slow, yeah. verify everything. I mean, we're talking about, if we're not talking about your eternal salvation, we're talking about life or death matters of sickness and healing and things. So this is not something to take somebody else's word for. Amen? You need to search the scriptures. Make sure what is said is true. Right? So he says here, um, <clears throat> man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taking him up. Now here's, here's where I want to get to. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. You got that? He says, If thou wilt, therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And notice, notice these key words. He said, <clears throat> He took him up, showed him all the earth, showed him all the kingdoms, showed him everything about it. And believe me, he presented it in the best light possible. Okay? And showed him all the glory of it. And he said, all of this was delivered to me. And he said, and I can give it to whoever I want to. Now, he's talking about the world. He's talking about the earth, right? When was the earth delivered to him? The earth was given to man. The earth belongs to the children of men. We just saw that, right? When was it given to the devil? Adam. Genesis, exactly, Genesis 3. So we can see when Adam handed it over, right? And now think about this. Here the devil is saying, hey, Adam handed it to me. I can hand it to you. And we're talking about the world. It's amazing. It's like it's just being passed around. You know, like it's be so oh, I, here, that's me. I don't want it. You want it? Here, you take it. You know? I mean, it's like it's just so simple, right? It's an easy thing just to pass the world around among spirits, right? And he says here, and I can give it to whoever I want to. In other words, it was given to me. And I can give it to anybody I want to. See how free it is? But now notice. So really the devil was talking and he's trying to, because he knew that if Jesus would bow his knee, yeah, he'd give it to Jesus. But now Jesus would have to serve him. Right? And so nothing had changed. Right? The devil would still have control because Jesus had bowed his knee. So he knew he'd be in charge. He just wouldn't have to deal with a righteous Jesus anymore. Right? So... Now, look what Jesus says. Jesus answered him, of course, and he, and he told him, he said, you're not going to worship anybody except God. Him alone are you to worship and serve, right? So now we can see that the temptation, now, now think about this. There's no uh, written record in the Bible of the devil ever offering that to anybody else, right? Now, I do think he has convinced certain people at times that they could get it. People like Hitler. People like, you know, Alexander the Great. Uh, you know, Napoleon. Different people that thought that they could actually conquer the entire world. But now notice, when they tried to conquer the entire world, notice what they were doing. They were fulfilling... Oh, boy, you, <laughs> you got to hear everything I'm fixing to say because if you just cut me off in the middle, you, you, boy, you're going to think it's wrong. Okay? But <clears throat> they were fulfilling the mandate in Genesis chapter 1 to have dominion over everything on this earth. Say, why? Because that is in man. It was birthed in man to have dominion all right, over everything. Now, you will notice also in Genesis chapter 1, it mentions everything. Other, the only thing it doesn't mention is other humans. It doesn't mention other humans. And yet, that's where fallen nature of man goes every time. Right? It's not satisfied with having dominion over an area of land. It's not satisfied with exercising dominion over animals or things that you own and that kind of stuff. It, it, it always wants to extend that dominion because of man's fallen nature over other humans. And that's where every war has come from, where people try to take land from other people and try to have dominion over other people. It's where everything has started. And the whole idea of slavery and all, it all came from man's fallen nature. Right? And man wanting to have dominion over other man, which is the one thing. Matter of fact, Jesus said, he said, listen, it's not going to be among you like it is among the Gentiles where you lord over one another. 
He said, you're supposed to serve one another. Amen? But what did man do? Man's fallen nature takes that dominion that's still in man, and he wants to exert it in every area. We've tried to conquer the ocean. How do we do that? We built ships, and when that didn't do it good enough for us, we built submarines. And now we got what they call them, bathospheres that goes down to the very bottom, <clears throat> miles down. Why? Because we're trying to conquer every bit of this earth that we can. You see a man, he looks at Mount Everest and he says, I must conquer that mountain. <clears throat> As if the mountain is challenging him. <laughs> right? But I've got to conquer this mountain. I've got, you made it. Why? Why'd you climb that? Because it was there. <laughs> Boy, if that's not a man's answer. You know what I mean? If you'd ask a woman, they would have told you, you know, <clears throat> an entire discourse <laughs> on why they needed to conquer the mountain. Okay? <clears throat> but with a man, we'd go, it's there. Ha, ha, ha. It's just there. We're going to conquer it. You know? Well, give me a reason. I don't know why, but it's just there. So Anyway, so that's just a man's answer. Anyway, it's just so. <laughs> so, but it's in man to have dominion. We've got to conquer the mountains. And whenever that didn't do it, we've, we've gone all over this world. Now all of a sudden we want to conquer the skies. Why? Because we're supposed to have dominion over everything that flies. So we want to fly. So we built planes. Why? Because we you know, can't flap our arms enough. So we built a plane that'll carry us around. And, and now we've even gone beyond that and said, okay, well, let's see what's beyond that. Let's see where else we can exert authority. I know. Let's go to the moon and plant a flag. Why? What, what does it do to plant a flag on the moon? Come on. I mean, think about it. Really? You need a flag there? It's because it's, it's, it's ours. It's our moon now. Just, really? <laughs> it's like, if there's any property you don't want, it's the moon, right? It's no good. <laughs> but it's ours, bless God. We got our flag right there. So, and we, got, and we see it all over. Now we got other people challenging us for the moon, right? We got China's trying to go to the moon, everybody. And now it's even beyond. Well, okay, well, you can have the moon. We're going to go to Mars. We'll take Mars. How's that? It's just in man to have dominion, right? We're never satisfied. With what we've got, we've always got to look beyond the fence, right? So, now, to go with, back with me, go to Matthew 21, right? So how far have we got so far? We show in Genesis chapter 1, man has been given dominion, right? And then we see in uh, Psalm 115, we see that the earth has been given to man. And then we see <clears throat> the temptation of Jesus where Satan is trying to get Jesus to take the earth in exchange for serving him. And we see that Jesus wins that, and he's, he overcomes, right? Now, Je Matthew chapter 21, and verse 12. Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. The seats of them. See, we also have to turn, turn over the tables. He turned the chairs over, too. That means they weren't sitting in them. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's some were still sitting in them when he turned them over. I don't know. But anyway, he ran them all out, right? And he said, <clears throat> it is written, my house. Notice again, he, what did he say? It is written. He's always saying it is written, right? My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. <clears throat> and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. They were upset, right? <clears throat> now, notice. And they said unto him, or said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise? So now you get the idea. He turns over the, the, the tables, all, all this commotion's going on, and yet the children are basically singing, right, Hosanna to the son of David. And now the religious leader, you notice they didn't say anything about him turning over the tables. They, they're only mad because the children are praising him, wow. right? And so he says, he said to them, have you not heard what it was said? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. Now he is quoting out of Psalm 8. So we're going to read Psalm 8, but I want you to notice something. Now I guess the author of the book, has the right to change words if he wants to. Amen. Right? I mean, because it's his work. But maybe he didn't really change them as much as what we, it's been our way of reading it that makes us think he might have changed the words. But let's see what was actually done and what was said. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, if you're like me and grew up in the 70s and the 80s, you can hear the song that goes along with this that we used to sing all the time 
I'm not going to sing it. I'll spare you that. But um, <laughs> it says, Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes, and this is what Jesus is quoting, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have ordained strength. Now notice, Jesus said you perfected praise. But here in the King James Version of this, it says you have ordained strength. So somehow Jesus is connecting ordaining strength with perfected praise. Now think about that. So what, how, now notice, how can you connect perfected praise with ordaining strength? Now watch, he, he actually tells us. He says, you have ordained strength because of your enemies. Okay? That you might steal the enemy and the avenger. Now notice, perfected praise is how strength is released to, uh, because of the enemies, because of God's enemies, because your enemies. And now notice what it says, that you might steal the enemy and the avenger. That you might steal the enemy, stop the enemy and the avenger. Now notice, you don't just have an enemy. We always talk about an enemy, the devil. But we don't have just an enemy, we also have an avenger. And we, the enemy means, listen, the enemy doesn't need a reason to attack you. He hates you, he doesn't like you, he attacks you, right? He attacks you because you exist, right? It's just that simple. But there's also this thing called the avenger. And the avenger is a person who technically has a right to avenge, right? Especially in the Old Testament, you will see that, that if one person in one family killed a member of another family, then that family had the right to come after that person and kill them unless they went and hid and lived in a city of refuge. And if they ever left that city of refuge, then the, the family could actually kill them. But as long as they stayed in the city of refuge, the enemy could not kill them. The avenger. They could not avenge their loved ones. Right Now, for us today, that would be saying, okay, look, uh, yes, the enemy is stealed. How is the enemy stealed? Because we are in Christ, right? And because of that, the enemy has no right to attack, right? And like I said, he doesn't really need a right to attack, but we have been given power, authority, and ability over the enemy's ability. Amen. So now, but now notice, we, not only do we have an enemy, but we also have an avenger. And that if you do something wrong, there, and I hear this all the time, we've even, there's a whole lot of preaching out there about it. Well, and it, it's usually along these lines. Well, I opened the door. I, I gave the devil authority. I, I gave the devil, you know, room to come in or move in or something. Okay, first off, okay, uh, you don't have the right to do that, mainly because you don't belong to you. And if you don't belong to you, you can't give the enemy right to you. Only God can do that. So that enemy doesn't have a right to you, right? But now notice, if you do something wrong, there is an avenger. But now here's the, the and, and he can come because of that, but it's not you giving, giving him authority. But now, notice what I'm, the point I want to get to. Is that it says that if you, by perfected praise, you steal the enemy and the avenger. So when you begin to praise, now you have to understand too, there is difference between praise and worship. Right? Praise is thanking God for what he's done or what he will do. Worship is worshiping God for who he is. See, there's a difference. You worship or you praise, or sometimes you can worship and praise. But you have to realize there's two different things. There's worship and there's praise. And praising, and, and this is why Jesus said, uh, you have perfected praise. What does that mean? That you are, now listen, you are releasing strength when you thank God and praise Him for what He has done or is doing. You get that? But you worship Him because of who and what he is, right? So you can worship him. God, you are good. You are just. God, you are righteous. You are holy. I'm wor you're worshiping, right? But you start to praise when you say, and Father, I thank you, and I praise you because by his stripes I'm healed. I praise you that I'm blessed. I thank you. I'm blessed coming in and going out. I thank, and see, now what am I doing? I I'm blessing him and I'm praising him for what he's doing or has done, Right? But now, but now notice the difference is worship is for who and what he is. God, you are love. Right. See, God's, when we talk about, I'm going to be ministering on this. It's one of the things I want to minister. See, I'm working it in. I'm preaching what God told me to, but I'm working in what I wanted to preach, okay, at the same time. And by these precious promises, we become partakers of God's divine nature. Is that right? Amen. By these precious promises. Now, the amazing thing about that is this. God's divine nature, not nature's, plural, nature. So these promises, 
we become a partaker of God's divine nature. What is the nature of God? Love. love. God is love, right? So what is the nature of love? The nature of love is to give. That's what love does. God so loved that he gave. Right. And see, if God hadn't loved so much, he wouldn't have gave. So part of love is giving. Amen? What else would be? So there's a whole lot more to the nature of God. But by these precious promises, we become partakers of God's love nature. Because of that, we reach out. Because of that, when you're born again, you want to reach. You want to help. You want to do good. You want to, to give, to help, to bless people. That's part of your nature. Why? Because that's his nature. And that's the nature of love. Now listen, the nature of love is to heal. Everybody knows that. And there, it, there's no question. See, if I say, well, what is God's will? Well, you know, that depends. Well, what is, what is the will of love? What would love do? Yeah. Now, see, there's no question about what love would do. But yet, for some reason, we call, when we call love God, all of a sudden, now we've got a question about what he would do. Mm-hmm. But the, the nature of God is love, and because of that, would love heal? Of course. Yeah. Why? Because it's automatic. You watch a child. A child, they see you, and they'll come to you and go, oh, you hurt yourself, and they want to help you. That's as pure as you can get. Why? Because their nature at that point is still of God. Right? They want to reach out. Why are you hurting? Don't hurt. Don't cry. I've heard children say that. You know, my grandchildren, different people. Don't do this. Don't hurt. Don't cry. And they want to fix it. Even though they don't know how, they want to fix it. Why? Because that's the nature of God in them. Right? Right? The nature of sin hasn't arisen yet. They haven't heard law or haven't heard anything, so the nature of sin isn't there yet. But the nature of love is still there, so they want to help. Why? Because that's God's nature. God's nature is to help, to reach, to bless, to heal, to, to, to help. Amen? Amen. Amen? And it's by these precious promises that we become partakers of His nature. Why? Because as we take these promises in the Word of God and start to apply them to our life, we take a little bit of His nature each time. Every time you read the Word of God and it says something about serving one another, guess what? You are partaking of His nature. Why? Because love serves. Right? It's the same thing. When it says heal the sick and you read that and you go, okay, I'm going I'm to start laying hands on the sick. What are you doing? You're partaking of the nature of God. Why? Because love heals. Right? It's just the way it is. Right? So anyway, that's, that's not my sermon. <laughs> I wanted it to be, but I submit. Okay, so, all right, so now look, he goes back on, he says here, watch this, <clears throat> out of the mouth of babes and sucklings you have ordained strength because of your enemies, now that you might steal, <clears throat> excuse me, steal the enemy and the avenger. Notice, not just the enemy, but even those that have a right to come after you, right? By praise, you can stop the enemy and you can stop the avenger from being able to avenge against you. You get that? Now that's good news. That, that right there Amen. ought to give you a whole lot more reason to just start praising. Praise Amen? And start blessing Him. But you have to praise correctly, meaning you're praising Him for delivering you from this situation. You're praising Him for delivering you from your enemies, from these avengers, right? I mean, man, you know, you ever seen some of the prayers that David prayed? Man, you know, I heard one preacher call, those are Dirty Harry prayers. Mm-hmm. Remember Dirty Harry? Remember? Yeah. Go ahead, punk, make my day. Remember that? All right, that, those are dirty, hairy prayers, right? God, uh, my enemies rise up against me. Break their teeth. I'm like, really? Break their teeth? I mean, I can think of all kinds of ways to say something, but break their teeth? I mean, come on. It's like, God, break their teeth. Grind them to dust, God. And, uh, you know, make my enemies uh, exist no longer. Let their names be forgotten. I mean, those are dirty, hairy prayers. I mean, he's saying, God, do you get them, you know, right? <clears throat> Tell me, have you ever prayed a dirty, hairy prayer? I, I have. <laughs> Lord, don't let them forget. Don't let them forget. Let them know. And, oh, and Lord, while you do that, bring up my name. Just yeah. remind them. You know. So, <laughs> so, all right, we're moving right along. All right, let's read the rest of this. He says in verse 3, When I consider your heavens, your heavens. Hear that? Why? Because the heavens belong to God. Amen. The earth belongs to man. Right? And watch. But he actually goes on. He says, When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him. Now think about this. He said, man, God, I'm looking at you. You are amazing. You're just, you know, indescribable. And I'm looking at all the things you've done and the stars and the planets and the moon and all this. And it's amazing what you've done. And then I look at man and I think, what is it about this puny little human that you're so enamored with that you create all of this for him? Now think about that. 
And he's, in, and he's speaking by the Spirit, of course. But he says, what is man? That your mind, why would you even have man on your mind? Here's God, and you got man, you know, that we're here 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever it is. You know, whatever it is, it's short. It's a short period of time uh, in the overall scheme of things. And he says, and yet you made all of this earth for man. Because the Bible says literally that, right? Now watch. He says, and the son of man that you visit him. Why would you spend time visiting man? And he says, for you have made him a little lower than the angels. Now, if you know uh, this word angels here, uh, both in the, well, especially in the Hebrew, it's actually the word Elohim, which is the word for God, right? It can mean magistrates, it can mean high level uh, authorities, but it, it is the word for God. And he says, you made him a little lower than God, than Elohim, than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. You hear that? Man, fallen man, was crowned with glory and honor. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because God had high expectations for man. I got news for you. Still does. Only the difference now is that the expectation is Jesus. That's the level of the expectation that God has for man. Right? Then he says, verse 6, You made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. It's talking about man here. Now, understand, it's talking about man, but you also realize that there's two other verses in the New Testament that it actually refers, has this exact same quote here, and it's referring to Jesus. But why? Because Jesus was the last Adam. You have the first Adam that messed everything up, right? Then you got the last Adam that fixed everything. And the last Adam is the Adam that we're now in. Now, when you're born in this world, you're born into the first Adam, right? And, you're, and then you have the fall of nature and all that. But when you get born again, you come into the last Adam, and just as you bore the image of the first Adam, it says, now we will bear the image of the last Adam, which means that we're going to look like Jesus. Now, when it says that Jesus, all things were put under man's feet, obviously he was talking originally, technically, about Adam, man, first Adam. But now he's saying, now this has been applied to Jesus because Jesus is actually fulfilling the dominion mandate, if you want to call it that, of the first Adam. Right? And now he has come back in, stepped back in. Now, here's the beauty of it. Because of this, Jesus stepped into this earth and because he was born of a woman, he has created a second race. You got that? There are only two races on this earth. And that is the race of God and the race of the devil. You got it? All this other stuff, people try to determine race by skin color or by national origin or something. That is the stupidest thing that has ever been invented by man. What? To try to divide people based on some kind of difference we're not realizing that it's the differences that fill in the blanks that actually cause people to complement one another, meaning that they fill in areas where others are lacking. Right. Amen? And that's one of the things about Azusa Street that uh, William Seymour was amazing. And he said, the bloodline has washed away the color line. Amen. And I've always loved that statement because is, it, should be so much, it should be so true about the church. Amen? Especially about the church. See, we have to remember, <clears throat> all the civil rights stuff, uh, the government didn't do that. That was a preacher. Martin Luther King Jr. was a preacher. Amen. And he led the civil rights movement. Amen? It wasn't started by no government. It was, the government didn't even want to go along with it. The government resisted it. Even though it had been a law on the books for over 100 years, it took a preacher that finally got fed up, stood up, and said, no, we're not doing this no more. And then started singing hymns, and spirituals as they call them, and actually caused the entire government to, to change its view and to line up with the law that had already been on the books for 100 years. It was a preacher. It was a church. And the meetings that were held in the early days were held in churches. They weren't held in city halls. And we need to remember, the government is not the answer to our problems. Amen. Amen. The church is the answer to the problems of this nation. Amen. Amen. And it's time that the church start to rise up and say what needs to be said regardless of who it makes mad. Amen. Amen. So, all right. <laughs> now, if I'm not clear on that, ask me again. I'll tell you clearer. Okay, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> just let, let's just be it. All right. Now, he says here, you have made him to have dominion over the work of your hands. You put all things under his feet. And if you go into Hebrews, you don't have to right now. But if you go into Hebrews and look up this term, it says, and yet we don't see everything under his feet yet, even though everything has been put under his feet. What does that mean? And he says he is seated until his enemies be made his footstool. 
right? So what does that mean? That means that everything legally has been put under his feet, but yet everything is not submitted. So now it's up to the church to make those things submit. And when the church makes those things submit and makes all his enemies his footstool, then he can quit sitting and he can stand up and come back. Amen. Amen? So he's waiting until all these things be put under his feet. So guess what? If we want to make this drag out longer, we can. But if we want to hurry it up, we can start putting things under our feet. Come on. Why? Because the things under our feet are under his feet. Amen. Why? Because we are his feet. Amen. Amen? Uh, Romans 16, verse 20. You don't have to go there, but you can write it down. But it actually says, And the very God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now get that. God is going to bruise Satan under your feet. Why? Because your feet is Jesus' feet. Amen. Amen? Now, he goes on here. He says, verse 8, All sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, fowl of the air, fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Notice he started with it, he ends with it, and in the middle he talks about the exalted position of man. But now notice the exalted position of man always has to be sandwiched between how excellent is God's name on the earth. Why? Because man has to exert God's authority on this earth to cause God's will to come to pass. Amen? Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 2, well, actually, uh, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, you hear that? This is Hebrews, New Testament. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? See, there's a lot of people, a lot of churches that stick on one side of salvation and they neglect a whole bunch of other aspects of salvation. We have to have the whole counsel of God. We have to be preaching the full gospel, not just a partial gospel. He says here, God... Also, bearing them witness. Well, I'm sorry, I guess go back. Um, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, when it says according to his will, it didn't mean that he gave them out every now and then. It says he gave it according to his will, which is to give it. Right? And that goes along with 1 Corinthians 12 when it talks about gifts being given. It says he divides severally to each man as he will. He's not talking about every now and then doing it. He is saying as he will, meaning his will is to divide severally to every man the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. Right? It is always his will to operate in the gifts through his believers, through his people, to minister the needs of people. Amen. Amen? Now, verse 5, For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? Well, where, who was that one? David. Where, where was that certain place? Psalm 8. We just read it, right? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hand. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. You hear that? Nothing. There is nothing that is not put under his feet legally. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Right? So in other words, he's telling them everything's been put under his feet. And yet we don't see it all being done yet. Why? Because who isn't doing it? The church is not doing what it should be doing. But that's changing. Amen? Amen? That's changing. Now, he says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Notice, it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. What does that mean? Everything that was made was made for Jesus. It was made by Jesus for Jesus. You get that? So anything that was made, see, too often the church gives up too much to the devil. 
right? And it's kind of, well, you know, it's like we'd say, well, separation of church and state. You know, well, right there, you know, uh, in our government documents, separation, separation of church and state. There is nothing in our legal documents that say separation of church and state. Right. Not one thing. It was in a letter written by Thomas Jefferson. It was not in any type of legal document whatsoever. It was something he said. He was a deist. And so he said that there should be separation between church and state. But now that has been taken to the place of not freedom of religion, but freedom from religion, which is what uh, some are trying to push. And we need to realize that we have freedom of religion. Amen? That we can practice our religion as we see fit. Right? And the government, government can make no law determining the free practice of our religion. You get that? But we have to exert that and enforce that. Now, he says here, <clears throat> everything. That's why when, when you, it says all things are for him and by him, then anything, when people say, well, you know, look at, what, okay, let's say uh, anything that has been made, has been made by him and for him. That means any area in our lives that have to deal with our lives especially, we have the right to submit that to the Lordship of Jesus. That means that whatever's going on, if it is not good for us, for our life, or toward, to move us toward uh, life or holiness or godliness, it can be changed because everything was made for Jesus and by him. Amen? And we are to submit everything under his Lordship because he is to have the preeminence in everything. So now, notice here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And so it is, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such are they that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. In other words, you're going to bear the image of the one you are after. So if you bear the image of the earthy, right, then it's because you are still carnal and not spiritually minded. But if you're going to bear the image of Jesus, you're going to be spiritually minded and not earthly minded or carnally minded. Amen? Now, it says in verse 49, and as, they, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now notice, Everything that was in us, old things are passed away. All things have become new, right? All things are of God. What? All things in our spirit. Our spirit has been recreated. And because of that, everything in us is of God. Well, who is God? God is love. Everything in you is born of love. You get that? Everything in your spirit is geared toward love. Even now, and Dr. Caroline Leaf, uh, uh, even she has shown that we are wired to love, Right? But because of the way the earth system is set up and because most people operate according to the earth system, that idea has been messed up and we are, we are actually rewiring ourselves in many cases to not operate in love. And the bad part is, when I talked earlier about identity, how the enemy attacks your identity, that's one of the main areas that the enemy tries to attack identity is in the area of love. That's why we have such a uh, preponderance of... Uh, I could even say an onslaught uh, concerning uh, deviant lifestyles because they think love is a feeling and if somebody makes you feel love, then you, that must be love and it's not because it has been to one degree or another perverted or in some way changed because uh, man was never meant right, uh, to live in any type of homosexual lifestyle. Women were never meant to live in any type of lesbian lifestyle. It is a perversion. right? It's a deviant lifestyle. Right? It is not love. They think it's love, but it's not love because it's based on feeling. Love is not a feeling. It's an act of your will. You understand that? Jesus didn't hang on the cross because it felt good, because he loved the world and it felt good. He hung on the cross because he truly loved the world and because he knew it had to be done. Right? It's the same way men get up and go to work, and women do too. I shouldn't rule either one out. But they do it because they love their family, and they go to work because they love their family. They don't go because they enjoy it necessarily, but because they're going to do what's right and because it's necessary. Amen? Because it's an act of will. Simple as that. Now, 
2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. To wit, or to know that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors, notice, for Christ. Ambassadors. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, so we have been recreated in his likeness and in his image, right? Now, 1 John 4, 17, because what are we talking about? We're talking about you taking your position in Christ. That means that you have to have a correct view of what Jesus came to do, that you have to have a correct view of his calling and how he functioned so that you can function likewise. Now, in uh, 1 John 4, 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Not in the next world, this world. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has torment. Now notice, why does love cast out fear? Because fear has torment. God is against torment. You got it? And God is love. And where love is, there can be no fear and there can be no torment. Right? Now, the problem is the world, and many Christians even, are still in bondage to the fear of death, the Bible says, all the days of their life. Now, until you break the bondage of fear, love will never be perfected in you. What does that mean? That means you'll never function in love, true love, until you have broke fear. Because fear of man, fear of rejection, fear of loss of reputation will cause you not to step out in love and minister to a person. You're afraid. Well, if I go pray for them, what will everybody think? I say, that's fear of why you're not walking in love. Love is to minister to a person. Love is to reach to a person. But fear will keep you from doing that. That's why love and fear are opposites. Right? So, now, he says here, um, <clears throat> There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You hear that? You were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not about works and, and, you know, and I don't believe in works. Okay, then you don't believe in the Bible. The Bible is all about works. It's about good works, not dead works. Dead works are works you try to do to somehow get some type of approval or some type of uh, favor from God. Right? That is not what works are for. Works are because you appreciate what God has done for you and out of that love and gratitude, you actually work because it's in your heart to work because love says, do what you can do. All right? It's real simple. So, but people say, well, I'm not into works. Well, then you're not into Jesus. Jesus was into works. Amen? He said, the same works I do, you will do also. And greater works. Not to be saved, but because you're saved. Amen. All right? That's the key. Then he says, uh, <clears throat> that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In Ephesians 4, 24, it says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The inner man was created in the image of God after true righteousness and true holiness. Now, Ephesians 1, 18 says, The eyes, in, yeah, starting in verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He has an inheritance in you. In other words, he has an inheritance in you that what you do with your life is his inheritance. See, we have an inheritance in Christ, but he also has an inheritance in us, right? He says that you may know the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That's the inheritance that's in us. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Notice where you've been seated. Far above all principality and power, dominion, might, all that. You're above that. That's why you don't pull down these principalities. You step on them. Amen. See, you don't pull them down. 
you pull down strongholds. That's teachings in your mind that aren't accurate. You don't pull down principalities. You cause them to submit. You put them under your feet, right? Amen. Because that's where they belong. Right. Amen? Amen? Now, what does that mean? That means that principalities, powers, are within, because they call the powers of the air at one point, that, that means that they are within the 90-mile radius around the earth. Why? Because that's how far man's dominion originally went. You get that? But now our dominion actually reaches beyond that into heaven itself. Amen. Okay? Now, he says here, <clears throat> Far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And, now look at this, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So again, it's all under his feet. You're his body. It's under your feet. You got that? Principalities, powers, all that's under your feet. <clears throat> now, which is his body, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Now, what I'm talking about is that you are to function in the fullness of what Jesus has. Now, it says in uh, Matthew 28, actually, we could go in further into Ephesians, and even says that we are to measure up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is what we are called to walk in. That means walking, living a different life, living a, a life of dominion in every area of your life. That means in every area. If we made a list, and we'll probably be doing that during our um, Wednesday night sessions once we start those back up, we'll be showing how every area of your life has, been, has to be put in subjection to Christ and put under your feet, and you are to exercise dominion in it. Any area in your life that you can name, you are called to have dominion in that area, right? You're not to have, it, nothing is to have dominion over you except the lordship of Jesus. Amen? Sickness, no, nope. you should have health, right? Poverty, no, nope. you should have prosperity. This is the way it is, right? Uh, health, life, in every area, you are to be blessed and you are to have dominion and you're not to be limited by anything of this earth. We are limited only by the power of God. Amen. Amen? Now, I will tell you this. God is only limited by how much you let him out. Mm -hmm. Right? He said, well, God can do anything. That's true, but can he do anything through you? Right. right? He might be able to do anything through somebody, but can he do it through you? Because you are the only thing that limits him in your life. Amen? Amen? And so God can do anything, but he can't do anything if you don't let him do anything. Right? And he can only do what you let him do. Right? Amen. Now, so Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power, all authority. Right? Go ye therefore. In other words, it's all been given to me, so now you go. In what? In some limited authority? No. You're going in his authority, which is unlimited. Do you get that? I'm, I, really, I hear that a lot. People talk about, well, the authority of the believer. And then they talk about levels of authority and this level of authority. And that. No, you do not have levels of authority. You have the authority of Jesus. Amen. Whatever authority he had, you have. Now, you will be, we use the term judged, okay, based on how much of that authority you walk in. That's going to be part of how, he look, he says when he returns, if you've been faithful over one city, He'll put you over five. If you've been faithful over five cities, he'll put you over ten. That's what he said, right? Now, he couldn't put you <clears throat> over five, right, if you weren't faithful over one, especially if you didn't. Somebody said, well, I didn't have authority to be faithful over that one city. So how's that? No, he gave you his authority, so you have the authority to be faithful over as many cities now as you want to be and have authority over. So your authority is not limited by anybody, again, but by you, right? And so by how you serve one city or five cities or a hundred cities, based on that, based on how much of the potential of Jesus' authority that you walk in, that is what will be basically judged and you will be rewarded based on that, right? And that's a whole other message and don't have time for it now, but hopefully you'll investigate it a little bit. So he said, <clears throat> Go ye therefore, teach, disciple all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, that means to know and to do, all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, what is this? This is Genesis 1. 
right? Doing what? Subduing. Everything that's crawling on the earth, right? And I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the ability of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the subject, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And don't, don't be glad because you got a little bit of power to do one thing. Rather be glad that your names are written in heaven. And that means all authority between heaven and earth has been given to you because you go in the name of Jesus and he has all authority. Amen. Amen. Finally, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power, ability. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that power is miraculous, a power that can be applied at will as necessary. Now, remember this. Authority is nothing more than pre-permission. God gives you authority. He has given you pre-permission to do everything he gave you authority to do. If he gave you authority to do everything he has done, the same works and greater, then he has given you pre-permission to go ahead and do it. You don't have to have permission to do what he's already given you authority to do. Right? A policeman can give you a ticket or arrest you. Why? He doesn't have to get okayed from headquarters. He doesn't have to call in and say, can I do this? Why? He's already been given permission when he was given authority as a police officer. Amen. You get it? He doesn't have to get permission at the point of the crime. Right. He's already been given that permission ahead of time. Right. You've already been given permission. Amen. Right? Whenever you were given authority, you were given permission to do what? Tread on serpents and scorpions, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, do whatever is necessary to fix the situation. That's a pre-permission. You don't have to get permission from God at any individual thing. It's already been given. Amen? This is big. You need to think about this. You need to meditate on it. Now, <clears throat> finally, I think I've said that about three times now, so it's about time. <laughs> but in Isaiah 53, it says, He shall, in verse 11, He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul into death, he was numbered with the transgressors, he bare the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus, he's talking about Jesus. He has already won, he's already defeated, he's already, already spoiled principalities and powers, made an open show of them, and he will divide the spoil with the strong. Who is the strong? Well, let the weak say, there you go, right? So that's pretty much anybody that is willing to say, I'm strong. He will share the spoil with you, which means that all of the victory that he has won over principalities, powers, spirits of infirmity, sickness, disease, all these things, he shares that with you. Why? Because you're a joint heir with him. Everything he has, you have. And because of that, now you get to share in the spoil that he affected when he rose from the dead. Amen? amen. Well, that would have been a good time for a shout. But anyway, amen. we'll go right on. So, Woo! next. Amen. Praise amen. Lord. Amen. Colossians 2.15. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In Ephesians chapter 4, actually I've already read this to you, uh, but it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, which you have because you have the mind of Christ, Right? And you know all things. Uh, you know, what, first, uh, yeah, first Corinthians 2, 16. And um, also uh, first, uh, first John 2, 20 and 2, 27. Right? Those are verses you can look up. Now, it says <clears throat> that we henceforth, or I'm sorry, uh, unto the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, a mature man, which is what? The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's your standard. Nothing less. That we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and by cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now he said, when you grow up, you won't be tossed around. You're going to be solid. You're going to be stable. The majority of Christians that I have dealt with, 
are not stable, right? Uh, in any department, they 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 go from one side to the next, and one and one thing will happen. Oh, praise God, I, I'm victorious. Next thing, oh, why is God doing this to me? And they're not stable, and they're and they're tossed with every wind of doctrine, when they're tossed around with everything that comes along, the church has to grow up and say, you know what? This is truth. Well, how can you... See, you're closed-minded because I can afford to be. I'm right. See, when you're right, you can afford to be closed-minded. Amen. Amen? You don't... You don't see, some people... Well, you know, I, I prefer to be open-minded. Yeah, okay. Uh, you're so open that nothing sticks. Right? It just comes through, passes through. So, anyway. <clears throat> okay, that's another sermon. Anyway, so he says... <clears throat> now... That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. See, it's easy to speak the truth. Speaking the truth in love is a little harder, right? Because, you know, sometimes you want to use the truth to cut, right? Well, if you're going to cut, you've got to heal. That's speaking the truth in love. Amen? So you don't just cut and leave them. If you cut, you've got to heal them. It's that simple. So, by, but by speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, that's what Jesus was saying. He said, because I have all authority in heaven and earth, you go in my name and do what I would do. Isn't that simple? This is your position in Christ. Now, I know we took a bit to get there, <clears throat> but I want you to get these scriptures. We can make them available to you, but I want you to get a hold of this. This is your position. This is a position that God created this world for you to walk in. He knew everything was going to happen and he made provision for it. And now we are blessed enough to not have been born under an old covenant, but we are blessed to live in the new covenant. And in this new covenant, is this, the new covenant is the new thing that everybody always talks about. You know, God said, I'm going to do a new thing. The only time he ever said that, go back and read it. He was never talking about a new building project or whatever else people want to use it for all the time. He said, I, I will do this new thing and you wouldn't believe it even if it were told to you. And that new thing is a new covenant. It's you becoming a new creation. And most people wouldn't believe it because they don't believe that a leopard can change his spots. But God can change the heart and spirit of man. And because of that, we are new creations. And this new creation, we have no example of how to live as a new creation except Jesus Christ. Amen. And he had dominion over everything. When he wanted to get across the lake, he would use a boat sometimes. Other times he'd just walk. Right. That's dominion over everything. Amen? <clears throat> People were hungry. He didn't have to figure out how much money they had. What did they do? He said, bring me what you got. What are we going to do? We're going to multiply it. Why? Because he had dominion over the things that grew on this earth, the wheat and the fish. and all. That. He had dominion over it. See, that's dominion. That's the dominion we're supposed to walk in. But it's a type of Christianity that the world has not yet seen. And because of that, it's hard for people to picture it because they haven't seen it. <clears throat> but somebody has to start living it first. Amen. And whoever lives at first, honestly, they get the lion's share, you might say, of the benefit because that takes the greatest faith to step across that line and quit living Christianity as normal and start living Christianity as Christians, the way the Bible describes. Amen. A position of dominion, a position of authority. Yes. Amen? Remember, man was given dominion in Genesis 1, and then you look at uh, Luke 10, and you look at Acts 1, and you see that man, at that point in Jesus, was given authority and ability. Authority plus ability equals dominion. Always remember that. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of this today? Amen. Are you going to take dominion, authority, and ability over uh, sickness and disease? Yes. Over poverty, over hurt, over want, over, over uh, emotional hurts? Amen. So you can have dominion over that. You choose your emotions. Your emotions, if you just leave them alone, they'll run around. You know, they'll just all, they'll run all over you. But you can choose your emotion. How do you choose your emotion? By choosing what you put your mind on. Right? Because I can have you watch something funny, and I'll have you laughing. I can have you watch a sad story, and you'll cry. Why? All because of what you fix your attention on. Your emotions follow what you fix your attention on. Amen? And when you fix your attention on Jesus, let me tell you, your emotions turn to dominion. And your emotions get stabilized and you start to walk straight and you start to realize no matter what comes, I shall overcome. Why? Because I was born for this. Amen. I was born to overcome adversity. I was not born to live in the palace. I was born to live on the battlefield. Amen? Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but guess what? You're all on the battlefield. Amen? 
you were born for this. You know, no, no, oh God, why me? No, no, no. If anything, the devil ought to be going, oh God, why them? Right? <laughs> Not, but the, for us, it's like, yeah, let, let me. We ought to be like Caleb. Give me that mountain. Let me take it. Yeah, I see it's big. Let me have it. I'll take it. Why? Because I know greater is he that's with me than he that's in the world. Amen? Amen. I know that I always triumph in Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's a spirit of dominion. You don't get that by fixing your attention on stupid Hollywood movies. Right? Let me tell you, Hollywood, the purpose of Hollywood was never, the purpose of Hollywood is to entertain and to distract you. It was not meant to edify you. And if you're looking for edification, you're looking in the wrong place. Amen? It's the Word of God that edifies. Amen? Amen. All right, let's all stand up. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you. Your Word is true. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that by these precious promises, we can become partakers of your divine nature, which is love. Father, I thank you even now that the words that I've spoken today, they are not my words. They are your words. And that because of that, they are words of spirit and they are life. And Father, I thank you that even as I've been speaking, that your Holy Spirit has been working to fix and change. Father, to pull down strongholds of wrong ideas, to, to build up, to edify, to strengthen. And Father, we thank you even working in their physical bodies to heal, to set free, to deliver. Father, I thank you. Your word is true. Yes. And that it has been established and it is settled in heaven. And we settle it on earth. Yes. We agree with you, Father. We agree with what Jesus said and with what he did. And because of that, by his stripes, we are healed. Yes. And we thank you, Father, that even now we are free. We are delivered. Yes. We are made whole by your word, by your spirit. Yes. And in Jesus' name, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.